So we've looked at industrialization in the 18th and 19th century, and in particular, the way that it produced new architectural types like factories, train sheds, uh, but also new architectural techniques, uh, iron and steel, uh, the glass skin. These are all obviously to us in hindsight advances in technology. These are things that we use today that make our buildings more efficient, more cost effective than they were uh, back in the, the 17th and 18th century. At the same time though, um, they change an awful lot about the way people occupy buildings, the way people build buildings, uh, the way that cities and even the countryside uh, looks. And what I want to look at in this lecture is the reaction to industrialization. We've treated it so far as a positive thing, right? Better buildings, safer buildings, cheaper buildings, more efficient buildings. Uh, but the, the changes that all of this industrialization wreaks on British cities in particular, British countryside in particular, uh, eventually the American cities, American countryside, and soon globally, um, is profound and people do have reactions to it uh, that are both positive uh, and negative. And I want to look today at what um, Kenneth Frampton has called the arriere guard. We're used to hearing the avant guard when we talk about art or architecture as the kind of leading edge, the most progressive, uh, the most interested in changing, the most revolutionary. Arriere guard is French for rear guard instead of advancing the rear guard holds back and is sort of digging in its heels, trying to prevent any greater changes uh, from happening. And so I want to start by looking, first of all, at, at this painting and how it shows the effect of industrialization on the British countryside. You can see that this kind of beautiful uh, landscape is either um, crowned or marred, depending on your point of view, uh, by a large colliery or coal mine. And as a subject for painters, this was both interesting as what was termed the sublime, a new kind of, of beauty that had to do with sort of overpowering, the, the overpowering uh, nature of, of industry. Um, but it's also very much kind of a critique too, that, that something is lost when the landscape ends up being disfigured by uh, all of these kind of buildings as tools, right? All of these in industrial uh, objects. The reactions that take place are important because a lot of them are still with us today and they define in some sense the way that we think about architectural technology, but also the way that that technology is kind of uh, yoked to an economic system or an industrialized system uh, that has consequences, right? Not all of them uh, for the good. To do this, I want to look at sort of four classes, four uh, types of reaction. Um, these are borrowed from philosophy. They're what are called transcendentals. These are questions that essentially have no answer. Right? They're too big to answer. Um, what, is, uh, what is good? What is right? what is true, and what is beautiful. Um, philosophers would call these moral, ethical, uh, ontological, and aesthetic questions. And I want to look at the reactions that 18th and 19th century thinkers have to what they see happening in their cities, in their landscape, in the products that are made in the factories, uh, and how these get to, to very, very deep questions about what it means uh, to make things, what it means to make things for other human beings, and what questions attach themselves to those. These, again, are, are questions that are still with us today. You could ask these four questions about contemporary architecture, and in fact, we will at the end of the semester. Um, but they, they really crop up in noticeable form uh, in the 19th century. So again, we're looking at uh, moral questions. What, what happens to us as spiritual beings when so much of our production ends up being sort of handed over uh, to machines? Um, this is the, the question about whether machines are, are inherently good or bad. Ethical questions. What are the human consequences? How, do, uh, how does industrialization affect social equity, what happens to the workers in the factories uh, when, when we industrialize, who gets affected, who does industrialization help, who does it hurt. Ontological, this is a, a, a little bit trickier. Um, what does it mean to be an industrially produced object? Is there a, a kind of truth or honesty 
to uh, an industrially produced object in the same way that there is one made by hand. There's a question of authenticity, right? Of what, what happens when we can reproduce things very easily. And then finally, aesthetics. Uh, what happens to our sense of beauty? What do we find beautiful? Uh, and how does that change when so much of what we see is produced by machines instead of by human hands? So we'll take these one at a time. In each case, I'm gonna present uh, a couple of thinkers who uh, look at the consequences of, of industry in architecture, but also in art, in the decorative arts. All of this is sort of seen as, as, um, as, as a, a, a continuum. And toward the end, I wanna show how in some ways these questions set the tone for uh, new movements in the, in the 20th century uh, in particular. So to begin with, let's look at the moral question. What are the spiritual consequences of industrialization? Uh, can uh, industrially made buildings be inherently good or are they inherently uh, evil? And for this, we'll look at two British thinkers, uh, Augustus Pugin uh, and John Ruskin. Uh, Pugin is actually sort of Anglo-French. Um, he's brought up in a French family and his life story is one of uh, conversion. Um, he is brought up a Presbyterian, so a, a, a Protestant, uh, known for uh, these, uh, a sort of interest in, uh, in, in purity, right? The, the, the Protestant reaction uh, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the days of Martin Luther is all about getting away from the corruption of the, of the Catholic Church and returning to a, a kind of purer form of the religion. That changes theologically, but the character of, uh, of Protestantism is, is still very much there. And Pugin sort of tires of this and converts to Catholicism, so converts to the older version, um, what, what Protestants think of as the slightly more uh, decadent version of, of Christianity in 1834. So he has a, a spiritual conversion, it's natural that he would think about the, the kind of moral character uh, of, of the churches that he's in, perhaps. Um, his father uh, had been involved in uh, the, what's called the Neo-Gothic, so this kind of revival of Gothic style uh, in Britain. Not in the sense that they were actually out building uh, cathedrals, but they were interested in kind of uh, reviving the aesthetic of the, of the Gothic. And this had a very, very particular kind of uh, religious or spiritual uh, character. And Pugin initially designs furniture for these sorts of neo-Gothic renovations and new constructions. He works for uh, Catholic churches, designing furniture that is appropriate to this new style, which becomes very popular in, in both Protestant and Catholic uh, churches. In 1836, he writes his first kind of philosophical tract called Contrasts, where he says that um, the, the, uh, the, the medieval Gothic buildings that are still there are these kind of examples of a moral way of building, right? A, 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 a spiritually correct way of building. And he finds that current construction, uh, in particular industrialized construction, is utilitarian, right? It's only concerned with optimization. It's not so worried about the spiritual character of the buildings uh, or the, the, the people uh, within them. And Pugin is one of the first to argue in print for a return to the, the sort of pre-enlightenment or even pre-Renaissance uh, society. So getting rid of all of this scientific advancement, going back to something that maybe wasn't so uh, optimized, but that had a, a, a more profound spiritual uh, character. And this is very popular among uh, conservative Catholics who uh, would of course like to go back to the, a time when their religion was ascendant uh, and wasn't challenged culturally or socially by all of these new scientific advances. He uh, gets a number of residential commissions. Uh, he's said to have, quote, invented the English house, right? The idea of the English house is something that he invents as a way to kind of go back to uh, a sort of fictitious earlier uh, era. And as we'll see, he gets what's probably the, the most important commission in Britain uh, of the, the decade before the Crystal Palace, uh, the new parliament or, or Palace of Westminster uh, in, in London. So he publishes this book, Contrast, which is essentially uh, boils down to uh, a series of images that look at 
the industrial cities that he sees around him. So you see in the upper right, it says, you know, this is the town in 1840. And on the bottom, uh, you see what the town looked like in 1440. And he makes both a, a, a kind of religious argument, right? He thinks that the, the industrial town is uh, Protestantism gone wild, right? That, that um, in reducing everything to very pure uh, kind of optimized um, uh, capitalist equation, uh, the spiritual character of the town has been overrun by all of these uh, factories. And he would like to go back to a skyline where, as you can see, the tallest things on the horizon are, no surprise, church steeples. For Pugin, of course, these would be best if they were Catholic church steeples. Um, but the factory hasn't changed the character uh, of, of the town at all. And whether he wants to actually tear the factories down or just sort of change society so that it eventually returns to this is a little unclear. But the, the, the idea here is, uh, is, is very obvious, right? That there was a time before industrialization where there was a, a spiritual uh, purity, right? A moral uh, purity to things. And here you can see uh, his ideas for both um, how to reform church architecture. He thinks getting away from the, the kind of Renaissance idea that you would go back to Greek and Roman forms and instead uh, going to Gothic forms. Pugin thinks this is absolutely right. He thinks that the, the Greek and Roman forms are pagan, right, before Christianity. The Gothic, he thinks, is the purest expression of this. And on the right, you can see that he is saying, basically, we have to go back and we have to take the, the ruined churches that we see around us and re-inhabit them. And when we build new churches, we have to build them in this, in this Gothic style, right? That is the, the, the purest moral or the, the purest Christian form uh, of architecture. And so he's arguing for the neo-Gothic, not just in terms of stylistic terms, but in terms of the effect that has on worshipers within and on the, the city uh, around him. And he applies the neo-Gothic uh, in, its, in its largest form, kind of ironically enough, not to a single church, but instead to the, the new palace of government that, that is rebuilt uh, in the 1840s. And as you can see, it is his own sort of take on the Gothic style, um, but all about this kind of vertical tracery, right? Emphasizing the verticality uh, of the building, which in a church, you remember, maybe inspires us to look upward toward the heavens. Here, it's kind of unclear what that is. It's applied as a, as a sort of um, uh, a, a decorative machine that, that um, Pugin thinks is going to help to restore the moral order uh, of, of the whole country. And on the interiors, this is where Pugin is at his best. He comes from furniture design. Uh, and here, as you can see, he recreates what to him would be a, 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 a Gothic uh, royal hall, right? Or, or, um, or, or government hall. And you can see the pointed windows uh, the tracery, all of these things that signify a return to the 14th and 15th uh, century. For him, a time before this kind of poison of, um, uh, of the Renaissance comes in and, um, and changes the spiritual condition uh, of society. So Pugin is, is a little bit of a scold, right? He's, he's very clearly a, a, a cultural conservative. Um, a more interesting take on things, maybe a more nuanced take, uh, is by John Ruskin, uh, who is brought up in a very rigorous Protestant uh, environment, but that uh, upbringing comes with a great deal of travel. And Ruskin sees not only Britain, but also Europe. And in 1835, a uh, fairly young age, 16, he travels to Venice for the first time. And he is completely taken with Venice as a city. He loves what he sees in the buildings. He loves the handicrafts that Venice is known for. The stone carving, the glass blowing that he sees is something that he has difficulty reconciling with the kind of rigorous, pure uh, upbringing uh, that he's had. He begins writing uh, shortly thereafter. He writes uh, poetry of architecture where he talks about uh, architecture being appropriate to its place. And then he goes to Oxford. And uh, after Oxford, he writes his first important book, Modern Painters. And this comes from his experience in Italy. He goes back and he thinks that both Italian painters and British painters, Turner in particular, J.M.W. Turner, who's at that time probably the, the best known uh, British painter, um, the, the, the painters of the era 
are far superior to painters of the Renaissance because of what he calls their truth to nature. Um, instead of trying to kind of um, uh, recreate precisely uh, what they see, um, they are looking toward a, a greater truth. Um, he calls this a moral truth, not just a material truth. So they are looking at landscapes and trying to make paintings that have this moral effect, right? That are not just reproducing what's there, but that are trying to influence people uh, for, for the good. And he says that this comes from the divine. The beautiful, he says, is a, is a divine gift and it should be put to use to improve the kind of spiritual condition of, uh, of people looking at the at, at paintings. He's interested in architecture in 1849. He writes a book called The Seven Lamps of Architecture, where he argues for what he calls a Protestant Gothic. And remember, the original Gothic uh, churches are all Catholic, right? Because they come before the, the Protestant Revolution. Um, but he says that a Protestant Gothic ought to be based on seven values. And when we read these today, we might think of these as sort of socially conservative, uh, but for Ruskin, they're important kind of touchstones for how uh, a, a good Protestant would lead their life and therefore how a good Protestant building should uh, encourage that. And these are sacrifice, truth, power, beauty, life, memory, and obedience. Um, he has an argument with Ville le Duc. He thinks that uh, the, the moral character of old buildings comes from their ruined state. He thinks that the, the record of what he calls accumulated history is more important than the sort of theatrical reconstructions that, that Ville le Duc uh, is arguing for. And he comes back to Venice eventually. And 1851, 1853, he writes a book called The Stones of Venice that is inspired by what he sees in the Venetian Gothic, which is a particularly lush variant of Gothic forms, right? Uh, lots and lots of ornamentation, lots of very, very fine, very detailed uh, stonework. And he sees in the, the touch of the stonecutter's hands uh, a link between what he calls thinking and working. And he, he thinks that this is a signal of sort of moral or spiritual superiority, that the, the idea that thinking and working have been separated in industrial production is a problem. And that the, the, the buildings of Venice, the stones of Venice, are morally superior to anything that we make today with machines because they're a record of that link between the stonecutter's mind and the stonecutter's hand. Ruskin's theory is very influential on a, 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 um, a, a movement of painting called pre-Raphaelite pre uh, painting. And the names, as the name suggests, this is a, a group of artists that want to go back in time before the Renaissance, before this influx of what they see as pagan forms and pagan influences back really to the, the Gothic, right? Which they see as the high point uh, of, this, um, of this sort of moral, spiritual, very Christian uh, uh, movement. Ruskin though is complex. Um, and in 1858, he has what he calls an unconversion uh, from Christianity. And he begins to think very differently about painting. It happens after he sees this painting, a uh, Veronese or so late Renaissance painting called the Queen of Sheba, which as you can see is an extraordinarily kind of um, decadent painting, right? There is a lot of very lush ornament. Um, there are a lot of voluptuous uh, figures uh, in the painting. It is uh, not the kind of restrained Protestant Gothic that, that Ruskin is, is after. Um, and Ruskin uh, takes this as a sort of challenge to himself. How can it be that he finds this so pleasurable? And he finally decides that um, as opposed to the sort of very conservative take he's had before that, quote unquote, things done delightfully and rightly were always done by the help and in the spirit of God. So he says that just because something uh, is beautiful and pleasurable, um, maybe it's not so bad. And maybe we ought to allow for um, this kind of uh, lush ornament, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, voluptuousness in painting. Uh, to, we ought to be able to enjoy it, right? That that too is a connection uh, to, to the divine. Um, and he writes sort of incredibly in 1858, to be a first-rate painter, 
you mustn't be pious, but rather a little wicked and entirely a man of the world. And he describes this as devotion without being devotional, uh, sort of being what today we might say um, spiritual without being uh, religious. And in the Stones of Venice, he um, eventually takes on this kind of argument that when we see things that have a great deal of craft invested in them, a great deal of attention invested in them, we find them necessarily beautiful, right? We find a connection between what we see and what the stone cutter has done. And because the stone cutter has invested that time into making something pleasurable for our eyes, um, we, we also uh, have, that, have that kind of investment, right? A spiritual investment instead of a, a, a physical one. Things made by hand are good. Things made with care and love and attention are good. And if that care and love and attention goes into uh, what we find pleasurable to our senses, like so much the better. In his uh, late career, uh, Ruskin um, it, it turns into what today I think we would call a, a, a socialist, but a, a fairly conservative one. Um, in 1862, he writes a series of essays unto this last that really um, uh, uh, critique the Industrial Revolution, what it's done not only to the landscape, but also to society, um, and turns really from uh, a moral critique, whether something is good, to, whether, to a, an ethical critique, whether something is, uh, is just. He argues for going back to uh, almost kind of a guild system where the economy would be one of cooperation, um, obedience, he thinks, like he's, he's very interested in, uh, in social hierarchy, uh, and philanthropy. So people would take care of the poor. Um, the, 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 the guilds, for instance, offered uh, poor uh, uh, teenagers basically uh, a way out of their poverty by, by giving them work. Um, he begins to teach at Oxford, uh, but, but gives up on that um, and opens his own school, uh, which in part, <laughs> he tries to make the, the case very specifically for a connection between thinking and doing by requiring his students uh, to participate in, in manual labor, including road building. Um, and you can imagine going to this now very well-known art critic to try to learn about painting, being handed a shovel, uh, this, this does not work, uh, and it doesn't, the school doesn't last very long. He attempted to found uh, some uh, communes that would have been based on medieval principles. None of them really work uh, either. But his influence is profound. Um, the idea that design and craft uh, should reject the mechanical, standardized, kind of formulaic design that comes with uh, both machines, but also with formulaic um, approaches. So that is not only kind of industrial production, but also systems of art like classicism, uh, where you're basically following rules that are still reliant on authority, right? So um, Ruskin says in particular that classicism is pagan, and he says that it's so ancient that it's kind of paralyzed uh, in its old age. He wants instead the individual liberty that came with the Gothic, where you might have, you might be assigned to carve a statue uh, that goes on to a, a cathedral, but you have some uh, leeway in how you interpret that and how your hands actually craft the, the, the individual piece. Um, he was cited throughout the 20th century, both for his political views and his artistic views. Uh, Gandhi, uh, in particular, was a fan. And he was a founding philosopher of what today we would call the liberal welfare state. So the idea that um, government really owes it to uh, the, the poorest of its citizens to, to make sure that they're, that they're taken care of. Um, he thought that art should be held to what he called facts or truth. Uh, not only in that they should be kind of pure in themselves, but they should uh, express this. And we'll talk a little bit about this at the end of the lecture, when we look at um, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, authenticity and also aesthetics. But he has this idea that somehow we have to be connected in our experience to how things are made and how things uh, work. He says that the goal is always the appearance of felicitous fulfillment of function. I think that's a, a, a good kind of summary of the, the expressive approach. We want to see how something works. We want it to be visually uh, explained to us. And to close out on Ruskin, one of the most interesting moments in his career 
um, is as he is uh, publishing the, the Stones of Venice, he goes to see the Crystal Palace and he halts publication so that he can add at the very end of the book uh, an essay uh, that, that is published elsewhere uh, in which he talks about the impact that the Crystal Palace has on him as a spectator, but also he thinks on the, 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 the design world, on the, on the craft world. And he comes out very, very much against the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace ends up being sort of everything that he stands against in, in his later uh, career. He, first of all, defines, this is, he gives his clearest definition maybe of, of art yet, right, or of, um, of valuable art, of morally good art. He says that um, the, the, the morally or spiritually uh, meaningful art is art which proceeds from an individual mind, working through instruments which assist but don't supersede the muscular action of the human hand. So he is in favor of manual tools. He is against steam power tools, right? There, there is a, a scale problem that he thinks is fundamental to this, that, that the stones still have to be worked with uh, the, the human hand. And the materials that the hands work on tenderly receive and most securely retain the impressions of such human labor. So when we look at a beautiful piece of stonework in Venice, Ruskin is saying the reason that it is beautiful is that we see the, 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 the kind of record of it's being made, of it's being cared about, of someone being attentive toward it. The Crystal Palace, he thinks, is impressive, right? It's very, very big. There is a great deal of what he calls bodily industry uh, involved. So that's all fine. Um, but he says that, that there, it is expressive of a single thought, right? And if we go back and remember Paxton's concept, Ruskin has it exactly right. Paxton's idea is that it might be possible to build a greenhouse larger than any greenhouse ever built before. That's fine, he says, but this thought and some very ordinary algebra, so optimization, mathematical, enlightenment approach, are as much as all that glass can represent of human intellect. What he doesn't see in the Crystal Palace and what he thinks is particularly important is the impact of the human hand, the record of the human hand, all you see in the Crystal Palace, he says, is machines working on materials. You don't get the, the kind of investment of human thought, of human care, um, of, of, of the human touch uh, in, in this building. And therefore, he thinks the Crystal Palace uh, is morally suspect, that it's not necessarily good for uh, society. It's not necessarily good for the workers who worked on it. And it's certainly not good for the spectators who see it and don't have this intimate connection with the, 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 the way that it was put together. Uh, in this case, not by human hands, but, but by machines. In the second part of the lecture, we'll look at a, a, a related critique. We'll look at the, the position that Ruskin moves to uh, in his late career, what we might call the ethical critique. Uh, does industrialization change the way that human beings uh, relate to one another, and does it have consequences for what today we would call social justice uh, or equity? And we'll look at figures who critique the industrial uh, revolution based on that and try to find within it ways uh, to address those issues.